So good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm uh, Kathleen Beulens. I'm a um, professor at the Leuven School for Mass Communication Research of the KU Leuven. And um, together with my team, I'm um, conducting research on the associations between social media and alcohol consumption already for some years. I think it's about 10 years. And in this presentation, I would like to give you an overview of um, what we've been doing in the past years and what our uh, current insights are. So often when we think about social media, um, this is the kind of content people think about. So these are recent posts of Instagram in which uh, brands um, um, share some things about their, about their beer. So you see a, a brand about, uh, or an ad about Jupiler, also one about Cara Pils, very popular these days among um, young adolescents. But this is not the only content we have to think about. So there are also other types of alcohol-related content which are very relevant to look at and which might have an impact on, um, on individuals. So there are three types of socializing agents which are uh, relevant to look at, and these are brands or advertising, but also the things that influencers and celebrities share. For instance, sometimes they also are paid to share something about alcohol, but they also often share things about um, their holidays or parties which they attend, or a picture of um, drinking a cocktail somewhere by a pool on an exotic island. So also these things might uh, influence individuals. And of course, there are the things we share ourselves. So that's what I've called peers here on this slide. So I think it's about 10 years that I uh, noticed a lot of um, alcohol-related content on my uh, own profile, on the profile of some uh, of my friends, and I was wondering, like, listen, is this something which happens a lot, or is it only in my own environment? So I started with one of the first studies on this topic, and this was um, a content analysis of Facebook profiles. And this analysis, this first analysis showed that almost 95% um, of um, the profiles in the samples contained at least one post showing alcohol-related content. Of course, of course, most profiles showed a lot more. And then the research um, continued. There was some follow-up research on Facebook and Instagram um, by my group, but also by um, different groups in the world. Um, and basically this research shows us today that there are different types of alcohol use on um, social media. And um, these types go from a range from more moderate uh, posts, such as you, you can see on the slide. Um, so people going to a party or sharing some drinks or proposing a toast to more extreme forms. You don't see these extreme forms so often, but you have to think about people being really drunk or, for instance, uh, teenagers vomiting somewhere in the street. But most of the things you see are, are rather moderate. Um, most often these pictures uh, depict personal experience. Um, sometimes there are some textual updates, but oftentimes it's in pictures. So mostly you see these alcohol updates in a social and in a positive uh, context. And of course, these are also often positively reinforced. This is the case um, with all messages shared on social media. But we noticed in one study that alcohol posts even generated more likes than non-alcohol posts. So they are often reinforced, reinforced by likes and comments. So all of this indicates that young uh, individuals, but also older individuals, share and view a lot of alcohol-related content on social media. It's also important to take into account that the media la landscape is evolving very rapidly. So we notice that there are some differences across platforms. So while most of the research at first was about Facebook, um, research now indicates that Snapchat, Instagram and TikTok have become more popular for the portrayal of alcohol-related uh, content. And there also exist some differences about what people share across these different platforms. For instance, if teenagers are at a party, someone is being really drunk and it's not very, uh, a very nice uh, view, let's say, they will rather take a picture on Snapchat and share this um, in this way with their best friends. Um, 
On the other hand, um, images which are shared through Instagram, for instance, um, often depict alcohol use in a more glamorized way. Um, so oftentimes these are uh, very nice pictures, they use a certain filter, everything is looking happy, very positive, and uh, none of the um, possible um, risks of drinking alcohol are shown. There's also some recent uh, research on TikTok. Um, Russell and colleagues conducted a content analysis of the most hundred um, of the hundred most popular videos with the hashtag alcohol, um, and what they found um, was that uh, overall um, all these pictures of all these videos showed alcohol in a rather positive way. Um, Content-wise, 41% of the videos showed drink recipes. Um, in 61% of the videos, people were consuming multiple drinks. Intoxication was present in 13% of the videos. Overall, positive experience with alcohol consumption were shown and hardly any negative ones. Um, a lot of the times, uh, these videos were also very humorous. So, you can ask yourself, of course, is this a problem? Well. I think it might be because um, also a lot of young children are present in TikTok. They see these videos. These are oftentimes very funny, but also once they viewed one such video um, and they liked it, the algorithm keeps generating exposure to similar content. So um, they keep seeing the same things over and over again or similar things over and over again. Um, so there's a lot of alcohol online on social media. Um, there are differences between platforms, but alcohol-related content um, also differs depending on the features of specific platforms. So research shows that adolescents spend a lot of time crafting the right drinking identity. So they are well aware of um, the risks of what they share online and the fact that their parents, their teachers, um, or even potential employers will see what they've shared online. Um, but they are also very aware of um, the fact that what they share impacts their image among their peers. And therefore, they aim for a very balanced self-display. So, they will share alcohol-related posts to show that they are someone who has a lot of friends, who likes to party, who has a nice life. But they will also make sure that what they share publicly is within the expectations of what most people find acceptable. And for this reason, um, so they use specific platform features and will um, very carefully think about what they share through which feature and through which platform. So, for instance, when they're at a party and they want to share something, they will first think, of course, all of this go, goes really quickly, is this what I want to share appropriate for all audiences? And if not, they make certain privacy um, adaptations and they share, for instance, um, their picture only through um, the best friend's story on Instagram and really think over this, that they will share it through the story and, for instance, not put it on their timeline because they know their parents um, or their teachers can see what they share on their timeline. So they, they um, make the, the, the privacy adaptations to make sure that they can share more risky images, like, for instance, the pre booze you see here, um, only to their best friends. So, of course, there's a lot of alcohol on social media. There are differences between platforms, differences between features, and um, individuals think very carefully about what they share where. But is this a problem? What is the impact of alcohol posts on social media, on individuals' offline behavior? Um, there are quite some studies which have been um, conducted in the uh, past few years. Um, the ones um, displayed on this slide are very interesting because these are meta-analysis meta which give an overview of um, a number of the studies that have been conducted in the past years. Overall, we can conclude that there is a positive association. So there is a positive association between um, using social media and alcohol consumption with small to moderate effect sizes. So this means that if you uh, use a lot of social media, you will also be more likely um, to drink alcohol use offline. 
So in a meta review of Curtis and colleagues, 19 studies were included which showed moderate effect sizes. Um, a more um, recent meta-analysis of Fanucci and colleagues uh, included 27 studies which showed small to medium positive correlations between social media use and substance use. So this was not only um, about alcohol consumption, this study um, included more uh, substances than only alcohol use. Um, Interesting is also that they expected these associations, for instance, to be um, stronger um, depending on the age of the respondents. They also expected to see differences depending on gender or race or, or ethnicity, geographic setting, but all of these things were not found. So um, the strength of the effects was the same um, depending uh, whether or not the age, uh, the age of the sample was younger or older. But they did found a moderating effect of the type of platform. So this means that um, when these studies included newer platforms such as Instagram and um, Snapchat compared to, for instance, Facebook, effects were stronger. Okay, so this gives us an indication already of the impact, but of course these um, were all cross-sectional studies, so they only indicate that two uh, phenomena occur um, together and not that one uh, causes the other. So therefore, to, to have an idea about the true impact of these alcohol posts, um, experimental research is necessary. And there's a very interesting study which has uh, just been conducted by some of my colleagues uh, from the Netherlands. Um, and they um, conducted a six week longitudinal study. So in fact, they um, developed an app and through this app, um, they exposed college students to two types of alcohol uh, posts. First of all, the natural posts, and these were uh, Facebook posts from the participants themselves. So they were entered in through the app, but these were posts that these participants shared themselves through Facebook. And then there were also a number of experimental posts which were made by the researchers. So um, through this app, they could um, carefully monitor what people were exposed to. Um, and then these people also had to report how much they drank um, during the whole time of the study. And the results showed that exposure to the natural post, but not the experimental one, increased the occurrence and the quantity of drinking on the follow following day. So this means that when these college students were exposed to a, the alcohol post um, through the app, they had a higher chance of a drinking event the next day, so they were more likely to drink the next day. And they also drank more alcohol in the next day. So this gives us an indication of um, a causal impact of exposure to these alcohol posts. Of course, it's not only about exposure. Um, you can be exposed to what others share on social media, but of course some people are also sharing this themselves. So that's what we wanted to look at in another study which was conducted um, in my lab in Leuven, and we wanted to see, um, we wanted to make a distinction between this self-sharing, so this is when you share something yourself on social media, and the exposure pathway, which means what happens when you're exposed to the content of others. Um, we studied this um, through a daily diary design, so we conducted the daily diary study um, in which we questioned adolescents um, every day about what they saw online, and they also had to report um, what, um, what they drank in the past days. So it was not an experiment, but a daily diary study in which we just questioned them uh, for a number of consecutive days. And what we saw was that the sharing of visual alcohol posts was the strongest predictor for alcohol use on the same day. So we saw these associations for both self-sharing and exposure, but strongest um, relationships were found for self-sharing. So meta-analysis show that there is a relation between social media use and alcohol consumption and that exposure can impact the number of drinking events and the amount of alcohol consumed. Yet, we thought, okay, probably this relationship is even more uh, complex. So we examined this in a, a three-wave longitudinal study among Belgian adolescents and looked how these relationships evolve over time. Um, 
and in particular this study, but also together with other studies which have been uh, conducted in the meantime, showed that there are um, transactional relationships at play and that there are in fact three kinds of spirals um, which play a role in these processes. And first of all, first spiral is the one uh, between alcohol consumption um, and sharing uh, alcohol posts. So you go to a party, you have some drinks, you take a picture over there, you share it on social media, so you have an association of from drinking to sharing, you drink first, you take a picture, then you share it. But what we see is that this sharing later on can also increase your drinking behavior. Another spiral is the one between um, sharing and exposure. Um, we see that um, people are more likely to share online what others are sharing too. So if you have a lot of friends sharing alcohol-related updates, you're more likely to share these updates yourself too. And then the third um, spiral um, is the one um, between uh, exposure and alcohol consumption. When you see a lot of positive alcohol, um, alcohol posts online, um, you're more likely um, to drink later on, um, and this drinking um, also is related to being, ex to being exposed to more alcohol content online. Why? Because you drink with your friends and you're also more likely to be related with these same friends online. So three spirals um, and also longitudinal associations, um, which means that there's also a long-term impact of um, what people um, see online and what they do offline. So you get it, they are related. But how can we explain these associations? Of course, um, a detailed understanding is very important from a prevention point of view. So therefore, in another study, um, we looked at or we tried to examine what are the underlying mechanisms to explain these associations. And two pathways appear to be especially important. These are social norms, um, including descriptive and injunctive norms, and attitudes. So the positive and or negative attitudes towards alcohol use um, are one mediating factor, and the social norms, including both descriptive and injuncting norms, are a second process through which um, uh, the exposure and the sharing of alcohol-related content on social media are related to offline um, alcohol use. So when you are exposed to alcohol use on social media, you're more likely to think positively um, about alcohol um, and you're or also more likely to think that more other people drink and that they hold um, or that they also like approve this kind of drinking. And from attitudes and social norms, we know that they are good predictors for offline um, behavior. But also the sharing um, is related. Um, Self-generated media effects theory states that by creating and sharing social media content, individuals can unconsciously uh, affect their own cognitions, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors, both directly and indirectly. So when an individual shares an alcohol reference on social media, for instance, to align themselves with their peer group, they can subconsciously infer that they are someone who enjoys drinking and partying and as such gradually increase their own offline drinking behavior. In addition, it has been shown that when you share these images, this might also affect how you perceive social norms. So this is what has been called a false consensus belief. Um, so they are more likely to incorrectly perceive that most others are also engaging in these behaviors. So both exposure and sharing of alcohol-related uh, messages online are related to offline alcohol use and misuse through the processes of attitudes, um, change and a change in social norms. So what have we learned so far? The things we share online affect our offline behavior through, for instance, the processes of attitude change and the change of social norms. The more we see certain behaviors online, the more we expect that others also engage in these behaviors and the more we expect that others approve these behaviors. However, it's not only what we see of others which affects us, um, also the things we share ourselves um, can affect ourselves. So these are a few answers, of course, but 
this also leaves a lot of remaining questions. One of those questions is the question of the uh, whether the effects are the same for everyone. Um, we know from other media effects research that the effects of social media on well-being differ from adolescent to adolescent. So it might be possible that when the both of us um, see the same content that I am affected by it and you are not. Um, in addition, probably we all use social media in different ways. So although we might all see uh, or use the same platform, we might see different content, we might also react differently to this content. So how do we explain this? Well, we explain this because people differ in a lot of different ways. There are dispositional differences. We differ in gender, we differ in uh, personality, for instance. Um, there are so also developmental differences and differences in the social context. Think about how you're socialized by your parents, peers, school. Um, and all these individual differences will determine how we use media, but also will impact the effect of media use uh, on behavior. So these individual differences determine media use and effect, and also make that there are differences in how people are um, affected by the media. We wanted to look at um, whether this was also the case for personality traits. So in one study, we examined um, the role of personality traits in the association between social media use and alcohol consumption. And what we found was that there were some risk-related individual differences. We found a stronger relationship between um, social media use and um, alcohol consumption for those with low levels of sensation seeking and um, low levels of sensitivity to peer pressure. In another study, we wanted to look at the effect of social context. So um, it was again a longitudinal study and we wanted to see, um, or we, we had three main aims. And the first one was, what is the role of perceived parental drinking behavior in this association? What's the role of perceived parental permissibility? And how do online self-presentations interact with peers' online self-presentations? And the results are shown on this um, picture. It might be a little bit complicated, but in fact, um, it's not. Um, what you see um, on the one hand, so we measured the sharing of alcohol references at time one. So this was a baseline measurement and we measured alcohol attitudes one year later. And we see on the first graph that um, the highest point is where perceived parental permissibility was also high. So this means that when sharing alcohol references and perceived parental permissibility are in alignment, so when they are both high, alcohol attitudes at time two were also the highest. The same for the um, perceived parental alcohol consumption. When the youngsters shared a lot of alcohol references at time two, and they also saw that their parents drink a lot, alcohol attitudes at time two were the highest. And we found a similar association for the exposure to alcohol references of their peers. So when individuals shared a lot of alcohol references and they were exposed a lot to the alcohol references of their peers, the alcohol attitudes one year later were the highest. So what can we conclude? Um, online behaviors seem to affect offline behaviors, both on the short and the long-term basis. Um, there is an important role of underlying mechanisms, namely attitudes and social norms. But it all depends. There are differences between platforms. There are differences between platform features. Um, individual differences determine how people will use media, but these individual differences also determine what the effects are of these social media on the outcome. So it might be the case that there is an effect for one person and not for the other. And the last um, conclusion is that context matters. Both um, online and offline behaviors interact, so you also have to take the context, for instance, with the parents and the peers into account. So, what are the implications for prevention and intervention then? First of all, I think that the results uh, might provide insights in which group are important um, to target with prevention campaigns. 
on the one hand, um, the results indicate that adolescents' online communication about alcohol is a reflection of their past offline behaviors. They drink first and then share it. So their online, um, so when they go to a party, have some drinks and share about this event, their alcohol consumption preceded the sharing behavior about the consumption. And on the other hand, studies indicate that being exposed to these references and sharing these references re might result in even more drinking behavior. So adolescents sharing such messages online are an important group to target for prevention initiatives. Second of all, um, given that the results indicate that um, contextual factors might interact with different uses, um, media and health literacy campaigns might be promising. The results show that parental drinking behaviors, perceived parental permissiveness, and what friends share online um, reinforce the effect of sharing alcohol-related content when, adoles when adolescents perceive these factors to be congruent with their own sharing behaviors. So it seems promising to make both parents and peers aware of the fact that um, they might be important role models for other people and that their own behaviors can have an impact on what others are doing. Third of all, um, active involvement interventions also seem um, something worth um, looking into further. Um, if sharing risky messages affects one's own self-concept, it's worth exploring whether these same mechanisms can be used to foster positive health outcomes. There are some initial projects using these ideas and, um, for instance, encouraging um, students to think about what they share before they share it, or maybe, for instance, sharing um, also the negative consequences about alcohol use, but far more research is um, necessary in order um, yeah, to make sure that this is um, really an, um, yeah, an intervention which works. And another potential avenue is to start at a, a source. Maybe it could be promising to make social media users alert about what they share and how it can impact others. Um, this can happen on the level of influencers. Often they share things without really realizing how this can affect others. But we also can do it um, with peers and adolescents themselves. Um, in the past month, there was a study in the Netherlands in which they looked at several um, ideas for intervention and they asked the teenagers themselves, like, which kind of strategy would you prefer? And the teenagers themselves um, told to the researchers, like, listen, we see most in a kind of automatic warning messages. For instance, when we want to update something, they would get, um, like, a message like, okay, you're showing alcohol-related content or you're about to share alcohol-related content. Um, are you sure you want to do this? Which might make them think about what they share before they actually share it. So... In the past year, uh, 10 years, we've been doing a lot of um, research on this, and I think we have a, a good view on how the processes exactly work and what the impact is of um, alcohol-related social media content. But these um, implications or the, the, the ideas for intervention still have to be tested, so these are only some potential, um, potential ideas, um, but of course they have to be tested first before we can implement them. So, okay, this uh, presentation gave an overview of what we've been doing in the past years. Thank you very much for listening. Um, would like to hear your questions. Thank you well, Kathleen Beules, for this very interesting presentation. We have nog wel even tijd voor vragen, niet heel lang, hè, want de lunch wacht op ons. Maar ik zou toch nog graag een paar mensen willen uitnodigen om een vraag te stellen. Als het oké okay is, ga ik de vraag in Nederland stellen. Uh, dus ja, ik ben inspecteur coördinator van de inspectiedienst uh, van onder andere alcoholverkoop aan minderjarigen. Uh, wat verwacht u naar de toekomst toe? Wat, heeft, wat, heeft, hoe gaat de, wat zal de impact zijn van die social media? Naar de verkoop van minderjarigen toe, gaat dat stijgen, denkt u? Gaat het alcoholgebruik bij minderjarigen gaan stijgen ten gevolge van de social media posts? Zo, op die manier. Um, should I answer in Dutch or in English? I don't know. <laughs> English is nog even. I will answer in English. Um, well, 
both of them are, I, I cannot, like, I don't have any numbers to, to, to substantiate my, my answer, but I think it is worrying what we see online because if we see how much time children spend online, it's um, multiple hours a day and they use social media more than, than they sleep or, or at school. So it's like um, so many hours a day that they are exposed to these messages. And for instance, um, like 20 years ago, of course, there was also alcohol consumption among adolescents, but they only saw it when they went to a party and they saw all the others drinking over there. But now they are exposed to these messages um, 24 hours a day. So I think it's worrying. Um, I don't know whether it will further increase, but it definitely plays a role. But also, um, it's also important to see that social media use is only one aspect in a whole, um, yeah, in a whole context. So as, as I try to explain in the study, for instance, also what parents do, what friends do, has an impact. Um, so it's only one factor and there are some things we can do. Um, so that's, uh, that's the positive message, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Zie je nog een laatste vraag? Ja, de rij daarvoor. Ja. In the beginning of the presentation, you were mentioning not only alcohol, but also tobacco and or nicotine. Were you also able to see the relation between uh, those kind of things and uh, the, the use with youth people? Ja, yeah, well, the media effect processes through which um, certain content can have an impact on people is the same depending on the substance you look at. So if people see a lot of um, positive images of tobacco or a lot of positive images about um, other drugs, you might think, okay, if you are exposed to a lot of positive images, you will, uh, this might affect your own attitudes and um, how much you think others are using these substances. So the processes are the same. Um, what might be different, we are conducting a study uh, on this right now, is um, like how accepted a certain substance is in society. And I think it's still different for, um, for drugs, although uh, like uh, I'm thinking about, I mean, there's a difference between marijuana or uh, heroin or alcohol consumption. And alcohol consumption is very accepted. Um, and this might be, or this is different for other drugs. So um, this might play a role, but then on the other hand, we conducted a cross-cultural study because we wanted to see, um, because alcohol use is very much accepted in Belgium, but maybe a little less in the US, at least the uh, age for drinking um, is higher, like the legal drinking age. And we did the same study in Belgium and the US to see whether this association between social media use and alcohol consumption was the same. And we compared um, Belgian students with students in the US. And we, we um, noticed the, the associations were exactly the same. So across multiple contexts, they, yeah, the same effect sizes and everything were found. So this gives an indication of the robustness of the results, I think. Okay, thanks a lot. I think we have to finish the morning sessions here. Thanks a lot, Kathleen, for your presentation.